おはようございます。物質材料研究機構の谷藤でございます。えっ、ー、と今日の基調講演についてえっ、ー、とご紹介したいと思います。えー、ロスウィルキンソンさんにえっ、ー、と今日はお越しいただきましてえっ、ー、とご講演をいただきますがえっ、ー、とウィルキンソンさんは、えー、オーストラリアナショナルデータサービス、えー、自称日本人ではアンズと呼んでいる組織の、えー、ディレクターをされておられ。聞くところでは今年でちょうど10年目10周年記念の年だそうですでこの10年の間オーストラリア政府の直結の組織としてオーストラリアのデータをアーカイブし使えるようにするということで今日は特にその中からアクセスを可能とし総合運用を図る皆さん今日ここにおいでおられる方はお聞きかもしれませんけれどもフェアファインダブル・アクセシブ・リユーザブルというインターオペレータブルこのフェアを通じてオーストラリア政府が何を目指しているのかというところを、えー、焦点にしてお話をいただくことになっております、えー、と今回、えー、とキットゴーでは日本来日3度目ということで、えー、ご自身は、えー、と自転車長距離自転車がご趣味だというふうに伺っておりますので、えー、違う季節にいらっしゃる時にはぜひ、えー、自転車でデータを集めるというようなこともあっていいかなというふうに思っております。ではよろしくお願いいたします。Please welcome Dr. Roskins Wilkinsons. おはようございます。Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you.、Um, I'm afraid I do not speak Japanese.、Um, And you probably don't speak Australian.、Um, so if you have concern and I have been not clear,、um, just signal, wave to me, and I will try to be clear.、Um, thank you very much for the opportunity of visiting you and addressing you today.、Um, th thank you, Professor o g a s a w a Professor k i t s u g a r a Professor Umezawa. Um, and, and thank you for the kind words of introduction, I guess.、Um, <laughs> they, they probably were very nice, I, I don't know. But let me talk to you a little bit today、um, about some research trends that I have noticed. I'd like to provide you with my perspective on the Australian experience with regard to research data. Uh, and then I'd like to finish with some reflections. So, here are some of the trends I see in research in general.、Um, and then I'll look at well, what is the data implication of that? First of all, and very importantly, is the scale of the problem that the research enterprise is addressing. So, the challenges are harder, they're more complex, they're covering wider ranges. There's not, it's not simply possible to go into a single lab and conduct a single experiment and come up with a result and do it again, as was the case perhaps 20 years ago. More often,、um, there is an expectation of research that will address problems of, of greater、um, challenge to the community. So there's a complexity issue occurring that, that it's not simply bigger. So, one of the things that some people say is that it's all about size. I actually think there's a lot about complexity that is terribly important. The doing research for research's sake is, I think, no longer、um, something that、um, our society is willing to invest in. They want to invest in our research in order to deliver benefit to the society. And along those lines, There's the need for reproducible research. We're seeing great challenges associated with that. So, if the research is going to be used, it's going to be highly reliable. And a response to all of that,、uh, a reason for doing open research is that it's a good thing to do, but it delivers value against all of those earlier elements. So, We're seeing、uh, a drive around the world. So, Jeffrey Roberts, uh,、um, uh, Jeffrey Bolton,、um, in 2012 through the Royal Society put, put out a, a document about science as an open enterprise.、Uh, 
um, really coming up with the problem of how do you in fact address uh, the age-old problem of being able to demonstrate that what you've done, uh, if you like, the, the results that sit behind your findings. How can you do that? The data has to be evidence. So evidence is more than simply here's the data. It's in a format you can't read, you can't understand and you can't use again. So how do you describe your information in a form that's useful in, in that form? And what does that mean? If, if you've got data that is at a size that cannot be accessed by an individual or a team unless they've got all of the infrastructure necessary to investigate that work, how do they do that? What happens when <coughs> the data goes wild? So there's a terribly interesting change that's occurring in health research where more and more research is being do done where the data is gathered from uh, smartphones and devices that capture data. But there is not quality assurance associated with that data. One has to deal with data that comes in from the wild. If one's working in uh, social sciences, much of the data might be gathered by um, means that include Twitter and Facebook. How do you do research when you're using information of that form? Or even you're using field instruments where the instruments are much greater in volume, but much less able to be deeply calibrated. So if we look at the global trends, the global trends are saying, well, you need to do research that um, provides sustainable development with equitable access. Uh, you need to build sustainable economies and societies. You need to build in human rights, good governance and social justice. These are the sorts of things that people are starting to invest, invest in. And now let's turn to a really big problem that exists, which is the irreproducibility of much of research today. The research paper as a output in its sole form clearly is no longer going to be acceptable. Um, the research paper can only be interpreted with the data that's associated with that with the methods that are associated with that, uh, with pointers to the instruments that were being used in that, that context. This little slide shows that the cost of irreproducible research is simply massive. So one might think about doing open science because it's a good thing to do. Terribly, terribly important, the reason for doing open science is that it's a waste of money to do it otherwise. So we need to think harder about how we're going to do research in that context. So if we say those are the broad trends about uh, research in general, what are the data trends that are affected by those broad trends? For me, perhaps as, more, as important as any, is what is trusted data in this context? What do you know about the data that has been used for research? What do you know about the data that is the evidence of the research? How do you describe that and how do you form that? So the area of provenance seems to me to be terribly important in this context. Next we need to have the data is open. We need to have it as accessible as is physically possible. This has to be for all research. So when we say open, we mean as open as is possible, maintaining uh, privacy of citizens and, and security, etc. But nevertheless, that necessity to make the data available is something that is simply not yet happening enough. And um, it's great to see the support in Japan around thinking through how do we achieve that. Next, as was noted, it may be the case that the research paper is less the key outcome of research than the research data that's generated by, by that paper. And so it needs to be properly cited. It needs to be properly published 
publishers are in fact requiring that data associate with papers to be of high quality and trusted and reliable and available. So what does all of that mean? Well, one of the possible responses is the data journals where you in fact publish the data as first class outputs of research. But that's not going to be the case for all of the research. What I want to argue for is fair data. Uh, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable data and I'll get on to that in a little while. But <clears throat> data is not cheap. It's easy enough to simply put a license on data and say there it is. But if you don't provide the tools for accessing that data, if you don't provide a description of that data, if you don't provide quality assurance for that data, you won't succeed. And so Thinking about research, one needs to be thinking about part of the investment in the research is investment in the fair data outputs of that research. It is expected in research that a fairly considerable effort is put into the research publication to ensure that it is of high quality. There has got to be an equivalent level of effort put into ensuring that the data outputs are of equivalent high quality. Data is incredibly important because it's a key mechanism that enables the translation of outcomes of research to beyond that particular research project. It might be to another investigation in another field. It may well be the case that if you do your um, data gathering very well, you can lead to direct commercial benefit as new materials are generated or new clinical practices are generated. But you've got to have the data as part of that, that story. So I think there's a great need to address the question of storage of the data that, that was raised uh, uh, earlier. I think we need to have a network of trusted data repository services. That is, we need to have places that are the equivalent of the journals for data where you can go to and know that the data will, will be well looked after, it will be available now, it will be in, available in the future, it will be available not only for download, which may be important, but it will be available for use because the appropriate data services associated with that data are available as well. And then there needs to be something along the lines of a data marketplace a place where people can negotiate the use of that, that data. They can work out how do I properly attribute my use to the people who generated it or how do I negotiate the use of that data in a com commercial environment. Um, interestingly, in this context, this thinking is perhaps most advanced in the agricultural where, area where farmers are very used to having to negotiate over the data that is associated with their agricultural enterprise. So I think these last two elements are things to be thought about for, for what happens next. I don't think we have a particularly robust network of trusted data repositories. We have some, uh, some of them located in, here in Japan. Um, but what we don't have is a routine mechanism where any researcher has a reliable place to place their data in that context and then equally a mechanism that enables you to negotiate over the use of that, that data. So what have some of the international responses been to these areas? Well, there's been data site and ORCID, etc. That is that if you're going to create a object of value, you need to name it so that it can be referred to into the future and used into the future. There will be increasingly data journals. Importantly, I think there will be harmonisation of data policies of funders. So just uh, last week, the Australian uh, Research Council, the Health and Medical Council and the uh, Association of Universities agreed that the outcomes of research including data would be regarded as first class outputs of research and so have to be treated as such. 
there's going to be a chapter associated with that. But doing it in isolation is not appropriate in my view. The need for engagement between different funders around the world in this context I think is terribly important because of course research is international and it's very helpful to have the rules of the game uh, agreed and, and there are a number of fora where such things are being discussed. There is also the policies of the, f of the publishers. So this is a pretty interesting area because publishers have uh, if essentially been the custodians of, of quality with regard to research publications. That's led to their ability to regulate how uh, publications occur and, and that's been to the publisher's benefit. It's less likely I think that will happen in data but it's certainly possible because uh, I think the publishers recognise if the data is not of high quality associated with a, a publication of high quality, that publication becomes less reputable. So they're very interested in protecting the reputation of the publications by ensuring the quality of the associated data. There are many open data initiatives, uh, an international response that um, uh, I recollect happened in, in this place a, a year ago and thank you again to the Japanese hosts of this event, the Research Data Alliance met in this very room uh, uh, a year or so ago. And then there was the European Open Science Cloud which I think is tremendously important because for me it's one of the vehicles that is addressing some of these challenges and asking the, the next question of how do you in fact make uh, f data funded fair? How do you have trusted data repositories? How do you have a data marketplace? So if data is terribly important in research, I think data is terribly important in translation. To get the most value out of research, you can't simply put the publication. The research has to be rep reproducible, so the data needs to be evidential in quality. The research data needs solid foundations, so the data for research must be quality assured. So this is the data that is made available for research. So I have this very, very simple language for talking about data in research. There's data for research, there's data in research, and data from research. The data for research, we need to know its quality because that affects how well we can use it. The data from research needs to be evidential in quality. But research data is also a commodity for trust building with collaborators and so there's got to be a means of engaging in the research enterprise using data to help build that relationship. And then finally the data has to be not only quality assured but it has to be available for many purposes because we can't know how the findings of any particular investigation might influence what happens next. But what we can know is if we don't think about those wider uses, we restrict the value of that data. <coughs> Excuse me. So connectivity is terribly important. This is one where the using the international standard is, is uh, uh, a obvious thing to do and has been uh, uh, occurring here in Japan, I know. The use of data site, the use of ORCID, uh, the use of Crossref, etc. Uh, we actually think there's a, a, a need, a missing piece, which is uh, a research project identifier, and so we're looking to develop something called RAID through the international community, in particular through RDA. Um, data complexity is, is interesting. So this is perhaps my favourite um, data connection story. So th this is related to Australia, so a little bit of Australian history. Uh, Australia started off um, many, many thousands of years ago with the indigenous population. Um, in 1788, the British government decided that Australia would be an excellent prison. 
And so it sent over guards and it sent over people. They didn't need to build walls because Australia is a long way from everywhere. Um, but the people they brought over, the prisoners, were not there essentially as a punishment. They were there as free labour. Now, this is not well publicised by, by our, our British colleagues, but really the idea was to develop Australia as, as a future investment for Britain. And so the prisoners' health was very carefully recorded. The next time the British uh, were very, very interested in Australia was the First World War. Now, soldiers are very, very important if they're healthy and not very, very important if they're sick. So as it turns out, understanding the health of the military is very, very important. Then Australia became interested in, in its history. And so there are many people, particularly people my age and older, who spend time tracing their past all the way back through uh, their involvement in military operations or indeed um, if you're able to say you have an um, ancestor who was a, a prisoner of the First Fleet, this is of high uh, regard in Australia. So if you've got prisoner past in Australia, this is a good thing. So following all the way back um, was quite possible because we had very good health records for early population uh, a good health records at the First World War and current populations and then people connecting all of those people. What that meant was that there was a very, very powerful database that enabled um, health researchers to study um, health trends over hundreds of years and look at particular populations and what the difference between a penal uh, population and a non-penal population and the variations there. So there was a great deal of data complexity but it enabled health researchers to do um, their particular epidemiological investigations at a much deeper level than was possible otherwise. Okay, so if we need data for research we want it to be of high quality. And I think there's good news here because it seems to me that increasingly the laboratories that are generating data for research are getting far greater requirements to create higher quality data. So when I go into a health research institute, the quality of the use of the data is quite variable the quality of the data for research is a very, very high quality. So we're seeing that occur. Just recently in Australia there was uh, a statement around any uh, of the nationally funded facilities that were generating data had to generate fair data. So the idea is you can't simply pour the data out and leave it up to the researcher to determine the quality. There's a strong requirement in, uh, along those lines. So I think we're likely to see industrial processes around data for research. Industrial, I, by that I mean a high quality, reproducible, you know the quality you're getting in, in that environment. But equally, the data that comes out of research can have high reliability homes. So in our social sciences in Australia, there's a very, very good home for data and this is the case for data around the world. The homes for social sciences data is actually of higher quality than for many of, of the other domains and there has been substantial investment in the curation of that data and the availability of that data for use around the world. So we're getting uh, the first part of the equation solved and the, and, and the last part of the equation solved, I think, fairly well. And then I think the European Open Science Cloud is in fact a game chamber, changer. There are many billions of dollars being investig invested in the European Open Science Cloud. I think for some people, this is an investment in technology. But I'm very confident that the European Commission 
and the member states are not investing in a technology called the European Open Science Cloud. What they're investing in is a new way of dealing with data and a new way of delivering value from research to the wider society. I think the Research Data Alliance, again, thank you for hosting it, is very important. It's there to enable the bridges to be built, but in a lot of ways, I think it's simply a place where people can come together to get, develop an agreement. That ag agreement might be within a particular domain, it might be across domains, it might be in a particular field, etc. But it's just a place where a lot of people get, gather together to come up with quite quick agreements around how to do these things. The reason I think it's important is that the, the data landscape is changing a lot over the next while. So we can't go slow. We can't gradually, gradually, gradually get to a point where we're going to have agreement by, because by then we'll have new challenges floating around. So I think the context here is to do work fast. So the heart of my message, I think, is that if you're going to do open science, you need fair data. The data should be published with a persistent identifier. It should be accessible. You should use an open license, as open as is possible. It should be interoperable so that the data that comes out of a particular investigation can be integrated with other data. And it should be reusable. It should be the case that you can use it to provide evidence of what you've done, but using it beyond the particular purpose. And so you need agreed formats, languages, vocabulary, agreed natures of provenance. Um, so quite hard things to do, and that's why I was ma making comment earlier on, that fear is not free. Open is, is possibly free if you just simply tick the box, but that's not enough. If you're going to do open science, you're open to everybody to investigate, and that means the data needs to be more than simply available. So I think it's interesting to see fair data as both an opportunity and a threat. Publishers are increasingly requiring published data. Funders are increasingly recognising research data outputs. So sitting in a world where your data is not fair, <coughs> excuse me, represents a possible challenge to research methods that have been around for potentially hundreds of years. Holding the data closely to yourself because you're asking for a unique advantage by preserving access to that data is the way that research has been conducted for quite a while. But that won't work, I think, much longer. So researchers are going to need to have their data in fair format in order to meet publisher requirements, meet funder requirements, and very importantly, and I'm going to get onto this in a moment, meeting institutional requirements. Because fair data builds reputation, partnership and legacy. Uh, the opportunity of fair data is to compete on ideas rather than a monopoly of knowledge. So if you can pause for a moment, this is the slide that I think is the heart of what I want to say to you, that, that making your data available in this form adds value in many, many dimensions. Okay, so I've made the argument that data enables research to be done quite differently, but the data practices itself can be quite transformative. And I think governments are increasingly investing in these initiatives precisely for this reason. They want the investments to be done to enable society problems to be addressed. This requires the data is in a wider form. And I want to give you a little bit of a, a sense of, well, what happened in Australia in this context because it's been investing in this transformation for 10 years now. So there was an investment called the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Investment, which said, well, we need to have infrastructure that supports research, but is not research. And I think you have a, a similar way of thinking about things in this context. It's been stable for 10 years. It's recently been announced for another 10 years. 
Uh, there's $150 million per annum being put into this and that's been varied up and down, but it's never actually gone below that. It invests in collaborative infrastructure, both physical and data. It recognised as an early statement that data itself is infrastructure. That is, data is part of the tools you do use to do research. Uh, there was, it was separate from the research funding. There were substantial national uh, assets created and then $20 million has been spent over the last 10 years on data and collaboration services. This is more than ANS, that's been about $10 million, but ANS and uh, our partners about 20. So what have we been doing nationally? Capturing data that's of very high value over a long period of time. Supporting the storage of the data, supporting the management of data and the enhancement of that data. The important thing here is that what's being done nationally is tiny compared to being what's done at institutional level. This is always the case that the bulk of the investment is through the research domains themselves, but nevertheless very important. I've had the opportunity of leading the Australian National Data Service for the last 10 years to make Australia's data assets as valuable as is possible. So, Rather than thinking of this as a data management investment, it's a data asset investment. How do you make the, those assets valuable to researchers, to the research institutions and to the nation? So that's why the investment was made. And early on, we characterised this as we needed to ensure that data didn't sit in little isolated cells, it was collected. It was managed, it was connected, it was findable and reusable. And of course, this is a precursor to the notion of FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. So the core ANS activities included data management, policy support, um, community development, because data is essentially something that you need to have a lot of cooperation around, you need to have skills. An important element there was to develop professional skills. So what we took to be the case is that you can't teach every researcher in the land all of the relevant data skills. It's very important to have a professional cohort of people with data engineering skills, uh, data curatorial skills, uh, data analysis skills, statistics, etc. So you have a wide range of professional skills available to ensure that the researchers are able to use the data as effectively as possible. Research institutional engagement was fundamental. So we thought that the data that is being generated in research will by and large sit at the institutions and be generated by the institutions and that's where we needed to work hardest. We couldn't do that just in Australia, we had to do that internationally and we had to start publishing data. That didn't mean storing data, it meant saying that there's a persistent identifier with it, it's got a custodian, it's got some rights management and here's where you go to get it. So what we did was we started to build up this, this system where we were saying much of the work will happen at the institutional level and we'll start building up a data um, area for data publishing and then we started to increase the quality of the data through metadata storage. Then we started increasing our collections descriptions and our publishing of those things and then we tried to establish something called the Australian Research Data Commons. And so the next phase of ANS is going to be an Australian Research Data Commons that brings together all of these different elements. But we felt that that was good but we needed to do more. We needed to focus more on how do we deliver value beyond the particular domain and particular area. We wanted to focus on the whole of the research system. How do you drive value all the way through the value chain? We wanted to increase the strength of our international engagement and so we particularly focused on the Research Data Alliance in that context. So what do we mean by data value? How do we make data more valuable? Yes, we can say, well, we're going to make it fairer. But if it is valuable, 
you can conduct stronger research because you've got new answers to the questions that you're able to uh, use. So if data is the new oil to AI, data is also the new oil to research in general because yes, we want to apply deep machine learning techniques to this, but equally we want to have people able to connect data in quite unusual ways. That example I gave you of the prisons data and, and the uh, military data and the genealogical data is only possible if you're able to make those connections. So we need to be able to do those things more, more effectively. We need more efficient research, just a moment for that. We need more trustworthy research, and so we need reproducibility. Research is by and large no longer trusted by our society. If we produce a research result and say, and somebody says, uh, how do you know it's true? You can't just simply assert, I'm a very good professor, and I go to a very good university, so you should believe me. That's not enough anymore, unfortunately. It is the case that we need to have evidence for our work. I think if we build our data correctly, we develop much stronger data partnerships. So I've had the opportunity to speak to the uh, vice chancellors of research in Australian institutions and ask them a question that they first of all found very odd, um, what's your research data um, strategy? And they didn't have an answer for that. But I, if I ask the question, how can data enhance your partnership strategy? or enhance your research strategy, it was very clear that data could play a very strong role in, the, in those contexts. And that's just as, case, just as much the case at the national level, institutional level, and the researcher level. And then if you do this right, you'll build much stronger um, partner relationships with industry. And I was having a conversation just this morning about how in material science, NIMS is trying to drive an agenda that builds a stronger commercial relationship using data as, as the force there. And then we need to work together internationally and we need to get the right partners in that context. I hope it's more than G7 just because Australia isn't actually G7. But. So, data is more valuable if it's fair. Publications are reliable means of making information available and data has to be reliable. It has to be made available reliable, reliably through these reliable data repositories. And so the work that has been conducted through WDS and others in the context of RDA on working out, well, what does it mean to have a reliable repository is very, very important because if you know the place you're putting your data has a seal of approval, then it provides a longer term answer to the question, where does your data live? We had a report done um, by an economist on the value of open data, which we found to be of enormous interest ar around the world. And really it was saying, uh, a very, very simple message is that if you make your data openly available, it gets used more. That's obvious. But if it's used more, the use of that extra, that extra use is of high value. So you move up from one or two uses to potentially many uses of the data. And that can translate to billions of dollars or yen value in making that data more available for, for more use. So there is a gap though, because research data can be a trust builder. It can be also seen as a, 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 a commercial advantage. If I keep my data secret, I can sell my secret knowledge to a industry partner and get value that way. But on the other hand, if what you're selling is your expertise in engaging with the partner, then there's a potential uh, gap to be bridged. Research data infrastructure is nationally and institutionally based. So that's good, but how does that actually translate to value straight down to the researcher? Because there is a gap, I think, bet for, between the value to the research system and the value to a researcher. The rewards for making moving data from simply it's sitting on my file system to here it is 
sitting in a trusted repository with all of the characteristics that I've described, what's the additional incentive for the researcher and the research system to get it into that, that level? So there is, I think, structural changes and also cultural changes needed to achieve that. In particular, I think you need to think about many different uh, characteristics that you want. You want the right technology to support this, to support scale, support complexity, veracity, uncertainty. But the technology challenges are only part of the story. How do you support the interaction of researchers with research systems so that it becomes easy to publish research data, easy to attribute your use of somebody else's research data? How do you put in place policies to determine the appropriate outcomes with the expenditure of public funding? So here I think the uh, open science uh, pilot that was conducted in the, the European Commission as part of Horizon 2020 was very interesting, where they put aside 3% of the total investment in research to say, well, if you're going to make your data openly available, you can access this extra 3%. Turns out that 80% of research applications said, well, I'd like to have a bit of that 3%, please. So fairly smart policy changes can make a big impact on, on that area. None of this will work, though, if the people aren't in place that enables this to be done effectively. So the development of a workforce that can support research in an open science world is necessary. I do not believe that one can simply train researchers to be open researchers. There is a need to have open researchers working next to professionals working together in an open environment. So how do we work through that? We need to have researchers engaged, need to the best data and simple means to be published and recognised. Research institutions need to think about what their strong holdings are going to be and how to preserve data value. We need to have improved data generating facilities. The national investors need to work out a whole of system approach to this. Internationally, there's going to need to be greater cooperation because to get the maximum value out of this, there's going to mean, need to be many opportunities of participation. So the needs and the values are very different as you move through the research system. So I quite like this little picture that you can't see any great detail of. But the idea is roughly on the left hand side you're thinking about all of the different ways that data will be generated and made available to the research enterprise. In the middle you've got a system that underpins the delivery of an environment that enables research to conduct the best research possible over an environment. So there's trusted data and trusted collaboration environments. Uh, the, there's associated cloud and storage and compute capabilities sitting below there. But what we're trying to do is to build an environment that enables you to do all of those things effectively. And then finally, the outcome of that is dissemination of those outcomes. This does not mean all data is made available because just like in research, you investigate some things that don't work. The evidential data is crucial in this context. So the achievements to date, um, a research data commons has been established, 100,000 collections have been generated. Perhaps most importantly, we've developed very good relationships with the research institutions. The universities have taken data seriously in this context and they've got much greater data capacity than they had five years ago. Uh, it's on the agenda of the Vice Presidents of Research. Uh, Australia, I think, has some very good research infrastructure in place now and it had the opportunity of participating in the Research Data Alliance. So what happens when it works? We um, worked with some uh, astronomers who were based in an organisation called CSIRO in Australia. And they'd had the problem of people keeping on ringing them up and asking for their data. And it was uh, annoying. Um, so what they did was they put in place a, a system that enabled them to publish the data. The data was easily downloadable and they got much greater impact from their research. 
In Northern Australia, there's a university located in the tropics and it said it wanted to create a network of tropical universities and tropical research. So it said, established itself as being a place where data in that area could be provided. And so there was great gain to the institution in creating that environment. So I think we've got stronger participation, we've got a whole of system approach and strengthened international engagement. What we needed to do was to commit, willing to not get it right. It's okay to pursue these things and learn as we go along. Um, it's a data investment, not a technology investment. Uh, we had, I think, quite robust um, governance in that context and identified areas. So I'll just skip through. I want to reflect briefly in the, my last uh, couple of minutes. Rather than focusing on the data problem, we wanted to focus on the data assets that are created through research. We wanted researchers to believe that the assets that they were creating were of enduring value. The value is not static. It's either more or less valuable depending on what you do with your data. Data is more valuable if it's fair. So if it's open, it gets used more. If it's reproducible, it's evidence. If it's well described, it can be used for more purposes. So make the data as open as is possible. Data is not a technology only. Ensure that a good workforce is in place, good policy in place, good process in place. Ensure that technology supports the best uh, behaviours that are being desired. Research publications are trusted. There is a strong mechanism around that. Um, peer review is an important part. We need to have trust around data just as strongly. That work is underway. I think uh, Japan has already made in initiatives in this regard. We need to think harder around how we might uh, make the value of trusted data increased in the research system. So in conclusion, the value of fair research data in open science is very high. The value is different for researchers and institutions and the public, so we need to balance those things. We need to get uh, the right mix of policy and skills and technology together. You cannot achieve these things through just one of those. And I think it's very important to establish the international partnerships that make those things possible. Thank you. It is indeed <laughs> very rich content, and I'm sure that there are lots of um, aspects that we'd, we'd like to learn from your 10 years' experience. However, we only have 10 minutes, so let's go ahead for questions or comments. えっと、とても内容が、え、深く広かったので、え、なかなか質問も難しいかもしれませんけれど、えっと、コメントあるいはご意見などありますでしょうか。Thank you very much for the uh, exciting talks. Uh, maybe uh, there are lots of audience questions, but uh, uh, m my question might be one of the most simple one. You mentioned about uh, 20 or 30 million Australian dollars for the data part. I'm not sure whether that is sufficient or not. I mean, actually, there might be lots of debates on how much money for the real research, how much money for the data infrastructure money. So do you have any idea? That is my first question. Secondly, uh, you mentioned about the importance of the data quality or reliability. Again, there comes uh, uh, yet another organized question, which means uh, if we want to produce uh, really, really high quality data to put a huge amount of the money to, to, to assure the data is really precise. But uh, I mean, it's uh, not uh, one extreme sense, 
but there are kind of spectrum. What is the most uh, plausible quality? That is uh, maybe key issues. And I think now we are in the stage not for the pragmatic areas. But we have to say somehow more precise way the how the researchers should do to collect the data and so on and so forth. That is one of the most important policy part of the answer. So do you have any idea? That my two questions. So there are questions there. With regard to the $20 million, I think we spent, roughly speaking, $5 million on building collaborative environments that enabled researchers to work over cloud environments, um, creating virtual laboratories. We spent roughly $5 million on establishing a layer of storage. We spent the other $10 million broadly speaking on value of data, making the data more valuable. Some of that was spent internationally. Uh, perhaps a third of that was spent on skills development and partnerships development. Uh, a relatively small amount was spent on creating a publishing service. Much of it was spent on building and buying coherence of research institutional approaches. So if you just create a national system and you have separate institutional systems, it's not natural that you'll get a coherence. And so in some ways we invested in coherence. Uh, another way of describing investing in coherence is that we bribe the institutions to do it in a national way. Um, so as long as you can go along with an institution with a check, you can have a conversation. On to your second question of, well, if we make all data fair in every possible dimension, the budget doesn't exist for that. I think that's absolutely true. I think this is where the skills of the archivists are going to be terribly important. Archivists are used to asking the question, how long should I keep something? So sometimes you know you only need to keep it for a little while because it's evidence, but the new instruments will be coming along and you'll be doing it differently. I think the work that's done in the natural sciences where you go out in the field and observe, you're going to need to keep that for a long period of time. But what do you need to keep is really important and the risk we have is that we will get um, into a theological debate about my data is more valuable than your data and you need to come up with very, very pragmatic decisions around come up with an international agreement that is a minimal set for how to describe my collection in a form that enables value to be added. Don't come up with the best, because the best is actually the enemy in this context, in my view. If you try to do absolutely the best, you can't afford it. And so it won't happen. So that researchers should value and choose the best to them. That's right. A and I think in that context, if a researcher has an information professional as their partner, they're much more likely to make that decision well. So the other element to this is don't ask researchers to do things they don't do well. You know, they're excellent innovators, they're excellent investigators, they're not actually excellent long-term preservationists. So ask professionals. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, exciting talks. The, I have the, uh, 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 the I have, uh, 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 few questions about the data format or data structure. The I'm the Achikyo, the, uh, the National Institute of Martin Science names. And if I say some data, data should have uh, some kind of uh, different structures, for example, uh, I'm working for the material science, and uh, even though my data is composed with the uh, temperature or something, but other the researcher data will be uh, composed of the another type of data. So if I say data, each data has a different structures. And uh, if I say correct such a confused data, uh, in some case we are going to the confusion. Uh, therefore, in some case, in the worst case, maybe data has no meaning for us. So, do you have some, in your ends, do you have some the policy in correcting uh, the data? So, our 
positional standards. So the best thing you can do within discipline is agree within discipline about what to, to achieve. Of course, the value may well be beyond discipline and then you'll need to come up with agreements between people who aren't in your own field. And so sometimes it's about doing these things in the domain and getting the maximum agreement possible. Again, going back to the earlier comment, introducing the maximum possible value of that data might be so high that it's not actually achievable with the budget. So there's always this balance of getting as much value as possible within the price that's being will willing to be expended. We've always felt that Australia does 2% of the world's research. So we can't afford to come up with agreements that are just Australian. That's, that's pointless. So for us, it makes a lot of sense to come up with an agreement that makes sense for us. So we have used international bodies, sometimes the Research Data Alliance, but sometimes in oceans research, there's been marine engagement about, well, what's a, an appropriate standard for that area? In, in materials, you're probably, uh, I think, ahead of the world, so you're in a very good position to work out what an international agreements would be. What I'd encourage you not to do is come up with a Japanese-only answer, because that will uh, optimise what happens in Japan and potentially isolate. Uh, thank you very much for your <coughs> very much fruitful talk. And uh, uh, my question is that the, uh, uh, so as far as I know, so some people say that open science and the data issue management issues, uh, some people say it's a paradigm shift or cultural change. And uh, so it, it's uh, not a simple challenge, it's a very much complex challenge. And uh, as far as I know, so one aspect in uh, Australia or Europe, Europe um, UK or, or Germany, uh, some so leaders in uh, society or leaders and academies are understanding that how open science is important and uh, how the science, how the way of the conduct of science need, needs to be changed. Uh, it's really important in uh, so social aspects of this change. Uh, the, but many countries, probably Japan is also uh, not really, uh, so uh, people are not very much understanding. We are on the way, I believe. Uh, do, if you have any advice or comments uh, for developing this change of the paradigm, uh, we are very much appreciated. I, I think the key from my perspective there is to invest in community. So these changes don't occur just through um, research leadership or thought leadership by leaders of particular organisations. They actually need the community to come along. And, and that's sometimes difficult because in some ways people my age have succeeded in the old way. <laughs> Right, and so there's an investment in the past. But what we know is that government wants to invest in the, f in the future, not the past. So there's a, a gap between agreed approaches that um, was developed, in, you know, I, I spent many, many years as a, as a researcher, and open science wasn't a topic. It turned out that I was involved in something that was an incredibly powerful example of open science, but I didn't know it at the time. Um, but what worked there was that there was a community established. Why did we get the big change in uh, the way um, genetic sequencing was done? There was an international agreement that said we can't do genetic sequence just by looking at individual SNPs. We're going to have to collaborate. So that agreement to collaborate was through international meetings. So I think it's very, very important to establish national consensus and international consensus to invest in community. Thank you. I think that the, uh, you are lucky and you are safe.
that you build before this new manner of open data culture come. So um, we have to go ahead in the next, next new 10 years decay. And I, I, I wish I could ask you, the, but I will ask later, is how does your government evaluate the data assets? That's a very good exercise to ask yes. you. えっと、いうことのいくつかのお話をいただいたのだと思います。で、多分あのかなり早かったので、あの私自身も全てを理解できなかったので、多分あの後でスライドを皆さんと共有して理解を深めていけるといいのではないかというふうに思いました。では、あの、again、